um, with talking to horses. And that's what I do, talk to all kinds of animals, but mostly horses. So that's my background. And um, one thing- I love the part about the Red Sox. I didn't know that you could predict what was gonna happen. That's, that's a piece I hadn't heard before. It was a funny thing. It does, I can't control it. It just comes on sometimes and not. So I know that's a, that's a funny one. Uh, and so what I would say to people is our first conversation, I talked more about the hows of animal communication. And if they go to your website, um, it's really now that equine, you say it, where do they go? Cause it's not Murdoch method, the right? My YouTube channel is where all the videos are. Yeah. So we did the first hour, we talked a lot about what animals are going through right now and ways you can use your own uh, animal communication skills that you have, you might not know it, um, to help them. And we, so, and then we talked about body scans. So and we're not gonna repeat things, we're gonna move forward, but just so you know it's there. And the other thing is if any of you have decided this is something you would wanna pursue and you're willing to put a little practice time in, I took all those classes that I had taken and distilled everything into a small mini course that I believe and and that's all really you need. You just need to make time to do some of the meditations. You can find them at lpconnections.com on my store. Um, the whole thing in its entirety of everything I teach in a clinic is $40. And if that's too much because times are tough right now, you can send me an email through my website and we can reduce the fee because this is just an opportunity um, right now, while we're all sort of locked down or closed in, this is a great time to be practicing skills. So that's my little push for that. I'm just going to interrupt you for a second because I popped this up on Facebook Live um, and so that people can kind of get to meet you a little bit. And it's up on the Surefoot Equine Facebook page. So um, just briefly, uh, just tell us a little bit more about what we talked about last time. That I mean, I know that in my opinion, everybody has the ability to hear what animals have to say. It's just that we either discount it, think it should be coming in some other way, or uh, doubt ourselves. Um, but from listening to you and from my own personal experiences actually, and I've had a number of them, um, the most, most notable one was when I had just gotten to Andy and I only had him for a few weeks and I drove him out to Washington State and stopped in Colorado on the way home and I'm upstairs sleeping and I hear I'm out of water and I'm like that can't be possible I left it with two big buckets and I went down and he had no water so I think we've all had an experience one time or another where we've we've had a sense or a feeling or something and then we find out oh that you know look th there it is whether it's with our family whether it's our with our children or with our animals um, and I think what, what you talked about last time was that like any skill, we must work on developing it for it to actually be uh, more consistent. Just like riding, we need to practice to make it more consistent. So can you just speak a little bit about that? Yeah, one thing I'll say is that when I do, and you've experienced this, when I talk to Al for you, your horse, you'll say, oh, I, you know what? I knew it, I knew it. And so many of the owners, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the different themes that I hear with the communication when I talk to horses. So many of them will say, oh, you're right, I knew that, but I didn't know it for sure. So I think if we could trust ourselves a little bit more, you are gonna be your own best expert, you're gonna be your horse's best expert because you know that animal best. And I also can say that in the classes that I took to learn the skill to actually communicate with a horse, which as I said, is on the mini course, you, um, I was in classes with people who had not felt they had any intuition skills at all, and they could do it. I think we're all actually born with, with a level of intuition. It's just that um, we, you know, like my grandmother actually, I remember a story where she talked about um, during World War II, she was reading tea leaves and she read that her friend's son had died or was going to die, and he did. And so she never read tea leaves again. But that intuitive, I think it's part of us. It's just a question of um, whether or not it's acceptable. You know, yeah. whether it's acceptable yeah. to us, to our social group, to our environment. And the other thing is that I find that just because I got this information, I always verify it. 
So it's like, trust yeah. myself, but verify. Um, don't just simply blindly say, well, okay, that's what was said, so that must be true. It's how does that fit in my known world? And some of the things I'm gonna take an action on, and some of them I'm not. And some of them I'm just gonna file and kind of see what happens later on. And I think putting it through that kind of a filter is really important because um, it's that discernment. Is this, does this make sense to me? Does this fit with what I know? Is it just another piece of information that I can put in a framework to see yeah. if I can make more of a shape out of all of this idea that makes sense and then allows me to take an action? So um, that's the other thing that I always yeah. tell people is that, you know, don't just take the information verbatim and, you know, blindly, but, right. you know, be discerning, evaluate, assess, verify, and then act on what seems right to you. I always say to clients, you have to filter everything you hear through me through your common sense before you act on it, right? Great. Ian, yeah, that's, a, that's medical, a very succinct way of saying what I said. <laughs> yeah, and if it's medical, it's got to go through the vet, yes. right? So just to be careful. But I would also say, um, you know those times when you're on the telephone and you've just said something and then you're pausing and waiting to see what the other person would say? You know, th there's a difference between receiving information and just listening to what comes in your ear, right? Or your head or thinking. Yeah. And when you think about whether to trust it or not, if your mind's really busy and you're worried and you feel anxious and you're like, oh, I think the horse is telling me, blah, blah, blah. I wouldn't trust it. But if you're calm and you think something came in, I think there's more chance that it's right on. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right, so anybody listening on Facebook Live, just join us on the webinar. You can find the invitation in the email that I sent you. And um, I'm gonna turn off the Facebook Live now, but uh, do remember that if you join my mailing list at murdochmethod.com, you'll get the email every weekend with all my webinar guests for the week. Yes. All right, great. So we had talked, I'm gonna just run through some themes after all these, I don't know, thousands of conversations with horses. Um, I think it's fun to, I thought we could start and I could explain a little that will then lead into why I think these pads are so important, your Sherpa pads. So, okay, cool. So I do have notes, so you're gonna see me look to the right a little bit. But um, one of the things that horses say that has just taken my breath away is that they are in your life for a reason, truly. Yeah. And they know what it is. So for some of my clients, they'll say, I'm here because this woman needs an escape. And when she comes to the barn, she's present. She, do she doesn't think about the rest of her life. She gets a break and then she goes home. Some horses will say to me, my owner has anxiety and she's learning to trust and she's working out and I came into her life because I'm trustworthy and she can relax with me and breathe and build a relationship. Um, let me see what else. Oh, some horses say, no, no, no. I'm here for adventure and competition. The real sport horses, the, the, you know, they love it. And they say, because she's got this fire in her. And if we weren't doing this, she'd be just working. That would all be all she had. Or she'd just have her relationship. And so I'm ready to go. And let's go. This is, so I love it's to really hear you fun. And actually, so many people, you know, they feel guilty or bad or, you know, I, I don't like me. I don't do anything with my horse or... Um, you know, I'm my horse's worst enemy. I, I, I hear people say that, um, or they're stuck with me. And I'm so glad to hear you say this because, you know, I think that in my opinion, we all have, have made a pact to be together and the horses and the owners, there's, there's a reason why they're together and you're validating that. Awesome. Yeah. And then, um, so I have this great story. I'm going to try to tell a few examples as I go along. But I was down doing a clinic in Virginia at Pam's and a woman, it was her turn. She rode her horse in and I asked her, okay, what do you want to work on today? And she said, um, this horse goes perfectly to the left. Um, walk track canter beautifully, but to the right, we can't get it. I don't know if he's uncomfortable. I don't know what he's trying to say. And so she shows us because there's auditors there too. And he does a beautiful in one direction and not and not in the other so, right and so then they stop and I do my thing and I communicate and I say to him could you tell us what's going on so he says to me well 
first of all, I want you to know I'm in my person's life because she's learning a ton from me. I'm in charge of teaching her. She's broken new ground. Uh, I'm a master, you know, teacher. And so I said, well, what are you teaching her going to, like this to this direction? He says to me, oh, well, her head. It's a disaster. She won't move. And so she's got to figure it out. I need to tell her, like, there's a problem with her hip. I say, does it hurt you? He's like, no, but she's got to, she needs like some, phys she's got to do something. So she starts just dismay. She says to me, look, I broke that hip. I'm in PT. I do yoga. I'm trying, right? So I'm translating. You can imagine that I'm saying this. So he, I feel this click that he really got it, you know, where you feel, I, I can't explain it, but sometimes there's just this moment. So I say to her, he get, I feel like he gets it. Go ahead out on the circle and go again. This time, perfection. He didn't have to teach her. So he just went around like a hobby horse, collected. So anyway, that's just, I really feel like they know what's going on. And then oftentimes when I tell a client, then they'll say, yeah, yeah. Right. In this case, he, she said, I've learned a ton from this horse. I'm always evolving. So another thing, another theme is uh, caring about people. It just, my heart, when I talk to these horses and they tell me um, their concerns about their owners, you know, um, they're very aware of what's going on in their life. So you can imagine that I'm with someone I've never met. I have a horse. She, I don't want to know anything in advance about them. And all of a sudden the horse is saying to me, you know, well, uh, my dad, meaning the owner's husband, lost his job and he's taking it out on my owner and she's not happy and she hasn't been happy for a while. And that's why I'm X, Y, and Z biting, you know? And so it's amazing how much they care about what's going on. They will show me they miss a trainer that they don't have. They miss a past rider. They miss people's children sometimes. Yeah. So it's really nice to see that heartfelt caring you know it's not like people come and go and horses don't care because i'm all of a sudden seeing a small i'd say to the owner like who's this small child with blonde long hair and they'll say oh that's my daughter she comes so um so they're very observant yes yes you know? they feel our energy they feel our moods they 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 get it. It's very interesting. They also care about other animals. So, you know, I'll be, I'll talk to a horse that uh, owner will say, well, he's been really depressed. Can you talk to him? And it'll be because the stable mate died. Um, they're worried about another horse in the barn. They will tell me about the cat that always used to come and sit on the stable thing and now isn't. So there's a lot of caring that goes into it all. Um, and you and I have done this, and you, you uh, even at Misty, where you, I can talk to one horse and they'll tell me which other horses are having trouble and what the trouble is. Yeah, like, um, so, um, like Bacon, the cat that was in charge of Pam's barn. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Bacon's the cat that um, he's in charge. And so Pam had, what, eight, 10 horses, and Bacon could tell Laura all about every single horse. Yeah. And I didn't know the horses, but he parades them through my mind. And I'm saying, okay, Pam, which one's the white one? And what's the bay? And what's the, and we just went through it. He showed me each horse and the dogs, four dogs. It was a long, what <laughs> funny. Um, so someone's asking, and the horse so talking? horses want a job. Um, we just have a question. Could the human be brought into the horse's life for a particular yep. reason? Like, like, is the person being picked by the horse? I think it's the way I would refer to that. A hundred percent. Yeah. I think it goes both ways. I mean, how many of the people watching have rescued a horse and know that you are the answer um, or have helped a horse in a way that they've never been helped before. So absolutely. Yeah, I think it. I I don't understand how life works in that way and how we meet the people and the horses we meet, but there's something going on. Yeah. So, um, so I was starting to talk about themes. Wanting a job is another one that horses pretty consistently talk to me about. Unless if they're in a lot of pain, they want to be left alone. But um, you'll remember Noble, who was the therapeutic riding horse, the white one at Misty Meadows. He's thirty. 
And when he may be 30 now, and even when he was going through a period of lameness and real discomfort, he said, when I talked to him, I want to do pony rides. And his other request was he wanted to be free on the property yes. uh, to greet people and be the mascot. And he tried. He tried that. He so, took out and then, his, um, went for walkabouts. Yes. <laughs> he, well, he was terrible. Yeah. But it was on his wish list. Yes. But he was great at pony rides. They were surprised at how long he could go and how good he was. And then it goes all the way to a client who um, I talked to that goes to the nationals in Kentucky every year. Mm -hmm. And boy, she was all over at this horse. She said she loves the, the grooming. She loves the crowd. She loves the adventure. She likes the trailering. She told me all about what her mom does for trailering. And so, you know, they like being busy. I would say that. And, I, and I'm saying I'm using those two going all the way from pony rides to nationals because it's so individual as to what a horse actually thinks of as the job that they want. Well, so I think that's true for people too, right? I mean... Um, we all have a job that we like better than another. And when we can find a job we love, we do it well. And the horses, when they, when we find the job they love, a lot of times I think people try to put a horse into a job that the person loves, but may not be the job the horse loves. And when we find the job the horse and the person love, then it really works. And folks, it's okay if it's not, the, you know, if it's not the job you want and you, you are, want to look for a different horse, I think the horses would rather be in the space that fits them than being kind of just trying to stuff them into something that doesn't fit. You know, it's just like us. Yeah. Yep. I agree. And so my last thing goes right on that, tails right on that, which is horses are trying to communicate. It's a, it's guaranteed. You know, we, um, and they want us to listen. And so when you're saying that, that's the same thing of really paying attention that the horse isn't fitting what you want to do and it's okay to let them find something else, right? Um, but I had a few categories of what they're trying to communicate um, or themes that have come up within that, which is obviously pain. And that was one of the things I loved about you, Wendy, is one of the first lessons I ever saw you teach. You know, you, the horse is acting up and you go to, is it the seat? Is it the tack? Is it that they are uncomfortable, right? And so that they need balance with the pads. And it isn't always what I grew up with, which is, she's the horse is being a pain today, mm. right? Yep. So um, they want, they're trying to communicate about pain. They're trying to communicate sometimes about tack issues. Um, I talked to this horse named Chardon at Misty Meadows, the same therapeutic riding center. and they he was getting girthy and they said laura can you just figure out does he have a stomach ulcer or whatever and so i did my body scan and i talked to him stomach was fine but he said he had these little tr triangles of pain on his ribs on the sides and that's why he didn't want to be saddled so you know we're trying to look at an anatomy book like what's over here on your sides and what could that be and then finally we had the brainstorm let's flip the saddle over and take a look and it had these little crazy, I've not seen it on any other saddle, but these metal triangles that have worked their way through the leather. Oh. So there was just like tiny leather between it and that was it. And he wasn't girthy anymore. So think about that. He's trying to tell you something and you've got, that's why this communication is such a great shortcut. It's so efficient to really figuring out what's up. Um, this is something you've talked about. They really wish they could have a warm up without the rider. I mean, any, any horse, I can't think of a time when they haven't wanted that. And that could include some horses wish just, you know, take me out of the stall, hand walk me for two minutes. Um, other horses are saying, let me get some juju out. Can I run around? Can I, um, can I um, be lunged? And some horses will ask for your pads because it's a whole nother way, right? To loosen up before you're going to be ridden. But who wants to get out of bed and put like, for us, it would be a 40 pound backpack, right? Before you go get your coffee. I think it's just something to think about to try to work in some kind of loosening. Um, they all want turnout. It's not always possible, but horses are constantly asking for more. And the, the sweetest thing is how many times they say, I just want this person to hand raise me or take me for a walk or be at heart height together, you know, and just have that little um, communication on the ground. So 
I, I just want to give people a few themes that I run into. And, um, and I think that will explain the, the rest of where we're going with the pads, because what happened to me is here I am, I can't ride. I'm having all these heartfelt conversations with horses. And then I needed to find a way to get back into my own ride, either riding or relationship with a horse. And so, um, I've developed this approach that I'm just starting really in terms of what I want to do. And it has to do with combining, uh, animal communication, the surefoot pads, which we're going to get right into, um, what Sharon Wilsey does with being a self lead safe leader and, uh, really picking up on the horse's clues, not, not intuitively, but really watching what they do and how they move. And then also our body language and communication so that they feel safe. Um, for myself, I'm experimenting, and this is not to say any judgment about anybody. I'm just talking about what turns me on is I'm really working with horses with no pressure and no treats. So I'm going into situations where I just stand with that horse and, and start from there and see uh, where we go. And then I'm doing the comfort stuff. So massage, energy work, which is where my next, uh, I'm going to show a little bit of that. Um, I sing to them. I don't know. A lot of horses like when you sing. Uh, maybe it's because it relaxes the people. And you breathe. Um, I think it's a lot to do. And you it. breathe. You yeah. breathe. Um, I get a fly whisk out, especially if I'm going to do your pads so they don't have to move off them. If they're not afraid of the fly whisk, they really appreciate um, me acting like a horse. You know, there's ones with the tail on the, on the end, a fly whisk. Um, and then I just have been, oh, oh, and affection, which is an interesting thing because a lot of the, so recently I've been working with horses that have learned helplessness um, or freeze. And I don't mean working intuitive. Well, what I mean is not in a paid situation. I've been just spending time trying to develop my own um, new way of being with horses. And they, um, and I lost my train of thought. Oh just seeing what do they want to do? So what do they want to do with me if I don't have an agenda? So that's my little, that's just it. I'm just throwing some ideas out there about what's going on with me. And I thought now we can go to, um, so, so there is a question. Um, yeah. Barbara's asking, have you ever found a horse that didn't like being ridden, but did want a relationship with people? Tons, tons. Um, primarily because they're not comfortable or they haven't had kind training. Yeah, so, and I, I think that you really have to um, have to look deeper into why they don't want to be ridden yes. Uh, yes. To, to answer that question because, um, you know, I, I think that that's, that's a big piece of it is that we can't just stop with I don't want to be ridden. And, I, and I've always said, especially with animal communication, what's the next question? Because if we just stop at that first question. Horses love to be ridden. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm with you. If they feel good and they trust the person. So last, uh, last time we spoke for an hour, I talked about Hunter and I'm going to go to him. But this is a horse who was so burned out on riding. And after we got him on the pads and we communicated with him and I was able to say, this is all. I mean, then he'd walk right up to the mounting block because he wanted me to get on him. Right. Yeah. I hope that answers so the person's just, question. It's, again, it's, it's being um, discerning, objective, and verifying, and, and being careful not to fall into the emotional trap. I think um, what happens is that we either feel like we're not doing a good service to our horse, or you know, we, we don't know enough, or we're not a good enough rider, or you know, those kinds of things. And we fall into this trap of, of, of uh, what's the word for it? But a, a type of negativity where we're saying, oh, my horse doesn't want me to ride him. Or, um, and what I think we really need to do is go, and why is that? And what is it that I can do? Whether that's- And also sometimes it's not true. Yeah. It's just not true. Yeah. I've talked to horses and I, a lot of my, I have heard a lot, a lot of times too. And then you talk to the horse and they prefer that rider over the trainer. They think the rider is good enough. They want them to feel confident and the pride they feel 
of saying, no, 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 I've got this. Like this person isn't, is sort of a beginner. Yeah. They're not as good as the trainer, but we're going. Yeah. And I think that the that, uh, emotional energetic connection in many cases, I, I'll give you an example. Um, when I was with Sally Swift, um, she was an 80 year old woman who was not very steady on her feet, who hadn't really been trained in human body work, but her touch was so powerful, even though her technique was not. And it was the, the intention that outweighed her technique a hundred to one. And that's really, I think when we start to think of it that way, that, okay, maybe our technique's not perfect. Maybe we're not, you know, we've, we've got more to learn about our riding or our training or whatever, but the intention I think overrides all of it. Wait till you see this next thing. Okay. Uh, Cause that leads right in. But I did want to say, I see the name Andrea Weedy that uh, Diane had mentioned. And I forgot to mention that she was the first person that I learned about who um, decided no pressure, no treats. Let's see where we can go together. And that's with riding. She still rides, um, yeah. but it's just a different, it's a whole different approach. So thanks. And Andrea's done a course with CRK training. I also have online courses with CRK training and all of those courses are open right now. In other words, normally they're closed and we do a launch and then you sign up. But uh, during the pandemic, Callie's opened all the courses. So if you're interested in learning about um, riding better with the effortless rider or more about Andrea Wadey or some in-hand work with Patrick King, all those courses are available at CRK Training. So great resources, you know, wonderful information um, and it all fits together. Yep, okay. And I would say too, I've learned so much from Callie because Callie does these interviews or videos once a week and, and I, have, I signed up and I get one a week. They're awesome, Callie yeah, King. She's, they're, her video blogs are amazing. All right, here we go. Let's try to screen share. Whoops. All right. <laughs> That's not a good sound. <laughs> what do you think? Yep. Okay. Is that working for you to see it? Yep. And if you want to hit your green or button, I... it'll go full screen. Okay, I do. All right, yep. there we go. So take a second to cut I want to tell the story of Hunter. He you guys, some of you may have um do me one him. favor. Yeah. Just turn the volume off on the video itself. Yes, good. Okay. Um, so Hunter uh, came to my friend Corinne. He had been in a riding program for, I think, 15 years and got extremely sore in the last years and frustrated and shut down and caused some problems and ended up at Corinne's. And this is him. And so I want to just show you some work that I've been doing with him in the last few weeks. So I'm really interested, Wendy, look at his hind end, everyone can. This is some fun we were having. It, but I don't know if you can see the constriction. It's playing jumpy, like it went from turning to jumping. So just pull it back and play it again, and they'll, it should catch I just up. Did. Shoot, I just did that, tell me if, so you know what, if this is us it, at Liberty, this is him feeling comfortable. Yeah, just well, yeah, I think if you grab the slider, after you hit play, grab the slider and then you can control it a little bit because it's jumping really badly. So, uh oh. Yeah, we, you're making the turn and the next thing you're at the jump and I'm not sure what happened in between. Oh boy, I hope we don't have that problem going forward. Well, um, yeah. All right, let, let me skip. So That's if you good. slow it down and grab the slider, yep, and then slowly drag okay. it, hopefully that'll work. I'm gonna get my, hold on one sec, I need to get something, sorry. <laughs> the, um, was really interesting, <laughs> when Laura and I were doing our test, her video is really good and I noticed it slowed down and it probably is the timing that people are kind of getting on the internet, but. Okay, so here's us, just watch his hind end, we're just playing. I don't know if you can see the pain point, but so he's can, so where I feel the pain, if you watch, is just stuck right here. Yep. In the, so from the point of the hip okay. down to the, um, into the hip joint area and tensor fascia lata and, um, probably you're tying into your quads. You know, that's really interesting after what, listening to Martina Neardhart and the fascial lines because it, I, I'm immediately um, feeling like there's really tight fascia in that area. 
Yeah, can you see it? Me too. When you look with, and, see, and yeah. the people watching too, if you look with soft eyes, I mean, even if you're not feeling intuitive, there's something not moving right there. But anyway, yeah, was, okay, let's go to the... Like you look at his head and neck and shoulder and it's much smoother, the skin is smoother, but in the rear end it looks... Yeah. So this, you and I have talked about, one of these is the psoas, which is I think what the problem is and it's making, it's, it's wreaking a little havoc. So. Okay, so what you're looking at right there in the anatomy is the exterior muscles. You can't see psoas in that picture because psoas is your tenderloin. So what your pointer, take your pointer up a bit, follow the femur, there you go. So you're, uh, yep, right there, you're at the greater trochanter. If you go up a little bit, the shorter muscle, that's your, um, that's glute me, uh, minimus, gluteus minimus. And then the other one is glute medius, the one going, yep, that's glute medius, and maximus is not on there. So as is gonna be, there's, um, yep, this now you're getting into biceps, uh, you're into your um, hamstrings there. So, okay. Um, so as is going to be super deep, it's along the spine. You got to think tenderloin. So if you like tenderloin, like pork tenderloin, beef tenderloin, it's running uh, from the diaphragm underneath the lumbar area. And then on the in medial side, it's going to come down. But, you know, certainly the fascia, and that's the thing about Martinez, that the fascia runs everywhere. And so you can't have tight fascia one place and not have it affect other places. But to me, it was more those exterior, uh, yes. you know, looking at the exterior. But, uh, you know, literally after Martina's lecture the other day, I'm sure that we're looking at fascia that's really restricted. That's causing that kind of tightness that- Okay, cool. Yeah. So here we are on slant. So, and when, is this running well? No, it's jumping. Oh, I'm so bummed. That's okay. I can always, if you send me the videos, I can put them into the, um, the, the, the webinar, you know, the, the recording. What if I go like this? Is this any better? If you grab the slider and go slowly, it definitely, it's still a bit jerky, but better. Yep. So oh. now he's dropped his neck and he's moving his right front foot and the lead shanks over his back and he's standing on the yellow slants. Yep. yep. And then just yawning and yawning. Oh, we haven't, oh, there we go. Now we see the yawning. And the chewing and another yawn. Yeah, you'll have to send me these videos so I can put them into the, to, into the replay because it, it would be really nice to watch this. So we'll okay. talk about that. After. I'm gonna just try to, Oops. I'm gonna stop sharing and try again. I'm so sorry because the rest of it was all wanting to show you these crazy things that he's doing. It's, it's okay. So let me just go. I, you know, it's yeah. just, what happens is bandwidth, right? Like, um, yes. when we have good bandwidth, videos play better, they're, they're always a little tricky. But like I said, I, I've added them into other lectures, so you can send them to me and I can add them in and then people can see it in the replay. But we can see him standing. I will. Closely. So, okay, so this first one, he's got the slants and he's swaying and swaying and yawning and yawning. Awesome. And then, oh, I just don't know, let's see. So what I wanna say about all of this is that once he had been on the pads, let's say twice last year when I first met him, um, now all I have to do is offer one to his nose and then gently touch a leg. And if it stays down, he doesn't want it, and if the leg comes up, he wants it. Because some of these horses with the learned helplessness or the shutdown, they're pretty automatic. They'll automatically lift up just because, so I don't ask in a regular way of you have to lift your leg. I just gently touch it. And so he helps me. So in this one, hopefully you can see that he elected to have first the black slants, then these just right, the, the He's on the purple on the pad. Left. He's on right? one purple pad on the left front and left hind. Yes, and then he started swaying that way. Oh. So he's working all those, you were talking about the, the all the fascia, right? Yeah. And, and I think this is an, another one of those. Let's just, I'll just take us through a little bit. Um, and it may I be that if him you, um, Laura, if you take it through slowly like that and then go back and hit yeah. play the video, it may catch up. 
so we can try that. So if you just scroll it through slowly, sometimes it's just a question of catching up. Um, it, that's the one okay. thing that, that he's got his eyes closed and his ears are really yeah. soft. So I, you know, this is a video that um, I, I might even, if you send it to me, I'll show it to Sharon because I'm talking to another yeah. webinar with Sharon on Monday and it'd be Great. really fun to have her look at this video and give us some feedback. I love that. Okay. So now I'm rerunning it. Is that any better? Um, it's sort of better, but that's okay. Oh God. There's ear. Okay. Let's keep going. I don't want to bore people, but this was a lot of blinking, a lot of yawning, and now he's rocking side to side. And then lo and behold, I thought we were done. And here's another one where you'll see he elected to have the slants back. Oh, cool. So after, what? That's cool. That yeah, so I thought we were so done, but I gave him the choice. What? He's so much softer through that right hip. Yeah, can you see the change? Oh, it's totally And then different. look at how he's, yep. Yeah. See, can you see how that right and then the left he's stepping through? Well, he just, he picked up his right hind foot and now he's just got his toe resting. And then he put his foot back down and he switched hind feet and then he switched hind feet again. And then he'll switch the front leg and his mouth is, uh, his lower lip is going. I'm just gonna move you out of the way. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of like flip, you know, when you had the little flip things as a kid. <laughs> Oh, that's nice though. Yeah. His eyes are closed. His ears are really soft. He's just doing little radar ears, really deep links, little tiny movements in the neck. You can see the body doing little tiny sways, the deep eye blinks, the ears just radaring around, making sure everything's okay. He looks really content there. Totally. And then this one, Look at that lip. I had never seen this expression on his face of that lower lip just sort of see it. He's yeah. just so internal that he almost looks like he's sleeping. And this was, yep, still the the back. So Laura, while he's standing on the pads and you're obviously standing there filming this and watching, what do you get, what do you pick up from the horses? I mean, that's kind of the thing that I'm curious about was what what do you sense in them while they're on the pads? It's, it's, a, it's, there's many different things. So one, um, I'll just run through this one while I'm talking because okay. you'll see that leg go up and down um, almost spastically when it's in regular time. Um, so I see that they go extremely inner. Do you see how his, can you see how his face twisted? Yes, his whole neck actually and his mouth. I'd love to see what Sharon thinks. But for me in this moment, he's so deeply in some kind of trance because imagine we've been going for about 10 minutes of pads at this point maybe a little less and look he's not he's just letting his body move in whatever way he feels it needs to and then a big lick and chew lots of swaying have you ever heard and of so, unwinding that's what i feel like it's like the layers are just going layers of stress are pouring off him is what it feels like to me and he can have an internal process, which I think these pads help horses with something called cellular memory. I feel like they can release trauma uh, when they're on the pads because they're changing their, the configuration of their body. They're releasing at the autonomic nervous system level. They're reducing cortisol and adre adrenaline. And then do you see how all of a sudden he kind of came back alive? Yeah. By the end of this. And then let me just show you then the funniest thing is he wanted this last pad. Can you see that the purple? Yeah. So again, I thought we were done. I went gently to each foot. He picked it up, even just me touching the foot, the leg right about here. And so I put this and he hung out like this for a little bit. It's so um, funny. He's made a slant out of the medium pad there. It looks like that's right. And look, it's the diff. He's just still sleeping. Oh yeah. And Laura, do you really think it's sleeping or do you think it's just a very deep, uh, almost like a meditation? 
I much more sleeping is not the right word. If, if the, he's completely um, inner focused. Yeah, bliss. Somebody said it's bliss. And you know, that's the thing is it's so hard to describe um, the words wise what we see because you know, if we think of it as sleeping, then we think of the brain being in a different state. And this is where ultimately I would just absolutely love to be able to hook up a horse's head to a EEG machine and literally see what's happening in their brain. And there are some techniques, I have investigated a little bit, but I've got to do some more investigation because the, we see this so consistently, this very deep um, level of relaxation but the other thing that I've seen so often, and I think you might even see here, is that when they come out of it, they're right there. They're present. It's not like they have to, you know, go through a process of waking up, if you will. Um, many That's right. Times horses come off the pads and can go right to work, especially if it's they're familiar with the pads. They can look tranquilized, literally, and then they come out. But I wish we had better words to describe that um, that deep internal state of relaxation well for me when i tell a horse and we talked about this last time the combination of telling a horse that they are safe and that whoever now owns them that everything's going to be okay and this is their home for example and then putting them on pads it is like they let down in the deepest possible way i feel it through my whole body i breathe deep they breathe deep i mean you've seen it they're just yeah. And this, this video is just him walking away, but hope, I don't know if you can tell that that whole, there's just not my pain signals going off on the right side. Yep. So not only does it help with them emotionally, but it's helping so much physically. And then when you, when you sense the, the, this particular horse on the pads, is, it, is there a pattern of release that you sense or uh, uh, is it different from horse to horse? I, you know, this is what I would say. I have, I have put aside all these videos. I am, I really wish you could see them because there's such similarities and it's a lot of what Sharon Wilsey talks about that you will see patterns, for example, right before they yawn, lick and chew, relax, let their head down. They start messing with things, right? So they're, they're trying to push into your legs or they're um, rattling something next to them, or they're actually just biting their leg and then they let go. So there's some common ground. Um, Have you heard of something called an extinction burst? No, what's that? So I'm um, unshare your screen for a second and I'll describe extinction burst. I'm trying to remember where I read about this, but there's the, um, in, it, it was in one of the books I read about changing habits and there's something called an extinction burst where you'll actually see an escalation of a pattern before you see it let go. So an example is a horse that tends to want to bite on the lead shank and he starts to not do that anymore. And then there you'll see this huge escalating. He might really try to bite on the lead shank. And then yeah. it's like, it's like the last gasp and then the pattern shifts. And um, yeah. so the term extinction burst has been um, applied to that. And it's not unusual with Surefoot to see horses um, do what I call, you'll see a, like a strong pattern, whether that's uh, strong tension pattern or a strong behavior pattern and or they can't stand on the pads and you'll see them become what i call less committed but it's still the same pattern so it starts out really strong and totally unconscious and then you see it be less strong but definite and then less strong and maybe even delayed and becoming conscious and then finally you see that there's um that there's either an escalation and a let go like an extinction burst in a shift to where they they're they let it go completely they're on another track it's literally like they've gotten off this train track and they got over on this one and this one takes them to happy town and that one's the old habit you know um completely and don't you think that's part of what we're seeing when we yeah when from before and after yeah um, so so marion says it gets worse before it gets better and that's also seen the Masterson method of fidgeting before release. So there's this common theme that we see um, with different techniques um, and in different species, but the consistency is the pattern that this sort of escalation yeah. and then a let go. It's like the nervous system's like holding Absolutely. out, like, I'm gonna try it one more time, uh, doesn't work. Okay, this is better. <laughs> 
I also find it's cumulative. So this horse, can I show you another yeah. thing? I feel like they, he, as he's gotten to know the pads, he has gotten more and more expressive that they, that they go deeper somehow into uh, giving him relief. And I don't know. Okay. Um, you've got to get out of full screen. So hit your escape button. There you go. Interesting. Yeah, it wouldn't let me. Uh, yeah, it's okay. Right. Just go to your photos, hit escape to get out of full screen, and then you'll be able to Perfect. pick it. Yep. Okay. So, so, so can you see this one? I love is that we start to see all these common themes, whether it's with, you know, Masterson or team or Surefoot, there's um, archetypal patterns or innate patterns within the, the mammalian nervous system that we yeah. see. Yes. Yeah, it's exciting. It's so exciting to put all this together. Um, so this, okay. Can you see my, see yep. this now? Okay. So I want, I, I want to talk about that a little bit because, and I wanted your feedback and I don't, tell me if this is going to run well. We'll see. Okay. So he's got his nose really extended, his throat latch really open. He's on that? This right is now? from energy work. Oh, okay. How, how is that running this video? Um, it's running a little better than the others. Okay. Um, because this is, so what I decided to do, and I showed that last screen of you and me in the clinic doing energy work, all I had done so far on this particular day was to put one hand, my right hand on his sacrum and my left hand on his withers. And this is how far extended he was. Now, I think this is because we had done pads the day before and he was already released. We're talking about like that layers of an onion, right? Yep. But look at, look at what he's done with his head. Yeah. This true. is not anything I'd seen him ever do before. And to take this photo, this is only now, he had been doing this for a while. And then this is just my right hand on his sacrum is causing all this. So let me go to the next one. And you'll see where the, what's going on with the feet, which is just. And what did you feel? Did you feel anything as you were doing the energy work and he was doing all this expression? I felt huge amounts of energy running up his spine from my hand on his sacrum. Oh, I just wish you could see. So his leg starts to spasm. So he's starting to stamp. Oh, okay. And then one leg, then the other leg, and they're going, and his, and his neck is totally extended and kind of twisted. And to me, I just felt like he was a little bit overwhelmed with how much energy was finally releasing up his spine. Or maybe spine. feeling, maybe even just feeling into his rear end. Yeah. Right? And look, can you see how he's just... Yeah. In the state. You know, one so, of the things I find that's so fascinating with the horses is that we think we have to do so much and really sometimes it's just so little. Yeah. And we are energy beings. Any of the people watching can do this with their horses and give them this release if they're willing. Um, but here he's still stomping, stomping with the back end, his front's going. It keeps going. I have a lot of this that you'll put up on the website. Yep. And then I'll finally, put it, put it into the video. Yep. He was so internal that I had to think about how am I going to ground him and help him get out. And so I, because finally I backed up to this length. You can see I'm I'm far away from him. He wasn't moving. He was still in that pose of stretched with his eyes blinking and his back end going. And so I offered him the the uh, yellow slam and boy he wanted it so here the other leg still continued but he got he seemed to this was what helped him transition he got back on the slants and he moved a little differently and i'll be able to put him so he's not climbing walls when i make put him in the video <laughs> right now he's like his yes good with this guy i can solve that yep i know it's okay i just turned my head okay <laughs> but I don't know if you can tell that his head's bobbing, his, his back end's going, he's still processing. It's like what Dr. Stephen Peters said about the dendrites growing. And what I feel when I look at him is that I don't want to go anywhere. I just need him to have the time and the energy to do whatever, whatever he's processing. 
Well, and that's the thing is we so don't know, like we can't know what's happening inside of anyone else. We, we can sense things, we can feel things, but to be honest, there's no way that we can really know what's going on inside someone else, but we have certain clues. And, and that's with the yeah. surface pads I find so often is I don't know totally what's happening. I can see certain things, but what they're experiencing and feeling, oh, wow, he just shook his neck. <laughs> it's like a huge let go. A huge there. release. And this is what I mean about the pads. I think they, and then chewing, can you see that? And yeah, then, yeah. And then still messing around with his back feet on the pads, kind of experimenting, picking his foot up, putting it back down. Wow, and his eyes closed, a lot of, a lot of, it's so fascinating. This is a very interesting horse because this is a different pattern that I actually haven't seen. I've seen a lot of yes. things, but I haven't seen everything. And this is one I have not seen, this kind of picking up the back feet, putting them down, extending the neck, re and repeating mul multiple times. This probably went on for 10 minutes. This is a different day. I wouldn't leave them on that, you know, right. from the one I showed you earlier. And what I feel is, let me show you with the cursor, with the mouse. I'm going to so, just move us out of the way. Okay, go for it. So I feel like I'm watching, there's something big happening right here. Can you see that area I'm pointing yep. to? Yep, in the loin. That, that's where, that's where I had, um, no, I guess my hand was on his sacrum at first for the energy work, but it, it did something. It, it's releasing something right in here, which for us, that's the lumbar. Yep. Um, vertebrae. So it's like our low back where a lot of horses keep their emotional and their physical trauma in. Um, and then this all looks clear to me if I look with, and then uh, right up here, I feel like he's over, he, like energy is going crazy right in here. Mm -hmm. And so it's a good thing. It's just all moving and it's, and it's moving through blockages. So there's well, a block so here interesting and because there's you're something basically here. looking at the cranial sacral connection there, aren't you? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, somebody's asked if a body worker could identify problem areas. Yes, they can identify problem areas, but again, it's, you know, um, if we think of it as a whole, and that's what Martina, um, her talk was so good, fashion and feet, is that basically you have to think of if you have like a cloth and you pull a thread, it's going to twist the whole cloth. And so while we can identify certain areas and, and every body worker is going to have their perspective, they're gonna see things from the way they see things. Like Laura see things from energy perspective and somebody who's um, a physio will see it from a muscle and bone and somebody who's an acupuncturist will see it from ener uh, meridians and acupuncture points. So it's like, I kind of think of it like flavors of ice cream. I use that analogy a lot. There's a lot of different styles of body work and different ways that we can approach this. But in the end, it's all ice cream. It's all a horse and they're experiencing different things. And we're, we're pretty much all heading in the same direction of having a horse free of restrictions and binding. Um, but we all have sort of our own particular flavors and approaches. Um, what, what I like about, and the reason I, that Surefoot has taken over my life is because <laughs> Um, it's simple and easy to do, and if you know how to safely pick up a foot, you can do surefoot without having to know anatomy, without having to have been trained in acupuncture, without having to go through massage school. Um, there's so much you can do to help your horses, just you know, with some basic safety guidelines and and a couple of pads. Um, and so that's one of the reasons that um, it's <laughs> literally it's taken over my life. Um, because it's something anyone can do with their horse and have huge benefits. And you don't have to be able to identify energy or feel muscle tension or that sort of thing. Although Surefoot ad asks, acts like a magnifying glass and you start to see more and more and more. Um, Dr. Feldenkrais always said, if you know what you want, you can do it. If you know what you're doing, you can do what you want. And in this case, if you can see what's going on, you can do something about it. Surefoot is kind of that magnifier that helps us see what's going on. Oh, who is that? That was a really interesting horse. Did you want to see that guy? Yeah. He's, a free, he's so expressive, but I can't stand that you won't be able to see it well. But it's just okay. I can add it in. So let me take a stab at answering that question too about body workers. Yeah. Um, just that 
Um, and I think they're amazing. And, and if you can afford it and, and you know a good one, I, I find horses oftentimes will put someone in my head and say they want them. And when I explain to the owner, this is who I'm seeing, it's a body worker. <laughs> but what I would say is that the pads, you don't have, they choose, they know what they need. Yeah. So you don't know what we're addressing, but it, it's what is, once they've been on them a couple times and they get what the benefit is, they will help you, right? They tell yeah. you. Sometimes it's diagonal that they want them on. Um, so I just think it's such a shortcut in, at times. Okay, wait, let's just yeah, look let's at this see. guy. This is um, Brom, my friend Corinne's horse that's turned out with Hunter. And I'm just gonna let it lick and chew. Yeah, it seems to be playing better now. Um, and you're not as broken up either. Earlier, you were kind of getting broken up. So I think it's, we just have more bandwidth now. Great, because he, so he wanted them in the front and then he got off them. And um, instead of giving up, I offered them and he wanted, you know, after he wandered away, I, I asked him again, he had them on the back. Now watch this. So what I love about what you've shown me is that sometimes horses will mess around before a release, right? Yep. And so, yeah, he's checking out the bag, but he's really dropped his neck. Yeah, watch this. <laughs> That's awesome. really cute you know i really i'm going to talk to sharon and um send me these video clips we'll talk about that afterward and then i'll see if i can play some of these for sharon because i think she would have some very interesting input about some of the things we see with this horse like what he does with his neck before he checks out the bag um and his whole expression there is really really great and this is a horse that i hadn't seen yawn before it's not like he always stands around and does this all right, maybe that was all. I thought we were gonna get three, and then this was his, hold on, let me. So, sure so again, Laura, when you put him on the pads, what did, you, what did you sense from this horse before you put him on the pads? Um, he's a pretty chill guy. And so, and this was, I think, his first time. And so this is him processing afterward. And, yeah. a big yawn. and then a big, shake that shake comes a lot as they're resetting and what i sensed when he was on it was just again the freedom he all of a sudden felt to pay attention internally to what was happening up here in his whole sacral area with those pads on the back and then to give that enough time that a little discomfort i felt him sort of snooping around because this was something was happening back here and he looked over at my bag and all that and then just that um, yawning as this sort of gave way and he took some really deep breaths in here in order to let it release. So do you think, um, you know, sometimes we don't notice our body and then somebody points it out, especially ribs, and then we're like, oh, oh, that's painful. And so do you think horses sometimes have that, like they've been blocking it out just like we do and then something suddenly brings their attention and so then they're, they're not sure what to do with it? I do, because I think horses are incredibly stoic, some of them. I mean, that is not a general, that, that's a generalization, because lots of horses are very dramatic. But you get stoical horses, and, you, and, and either I do the energy work, or, there, or I invite, I say, would you like me to massage you? And just that much, or putting them on pads, it asks them to come inward, and you can see them then having to deal with what's uncomfortable. Yeah, and so sometimes, like, I'll put a horse on a pad, and they'll, they'll kind of, oh, somebody actually posted a video of this up on the Surefoot Equine fans page. And the, the, it was a full physio pad and the horse was standing on it. And then he kind of stuck his nose down and then he started pawing on the pad. And my take on it was he couldn't understand what was going on. It yeah. confused him. Yep. Yep. And so that, is that something that you've picked up with some horses that, that it's like, like, I don't know what this, I feel different, but I don't know that I want to feel this difference. And it's, and it's kind of uncomfortable is quite the wrong word, but change. But, well, I would say maybe threatening. Oh, okay. It's a little, I don't know what these pads do, but they create a lot of sensation. 
Yeah. So I've seen when you introduce the pads for the first time, you put the front foot on and they feel it and they stand there for a second, they go, ah, and they wander away. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, because they're starting to get something. What I feel is something's starting to run up that leg and they're not, and, and they don't want to feel it come all the way up here. Yeah, so that, that's a good, uh, that, that was kind of what I was wondering. And that's when I watched this particular horse, that was what I got was he couldn't understand the sensation. And so it was just a little disturbing, a little confusing, a little bit interesting, you know, like a really mixed message. Is, is it food? Is it something I should right. you know, buy? He was kind of nibbling on it. He was pulling it back. But the sort of general idea, how about stunned? <laughs> Marion says, how I about like that? Stunned? That's actually a possibility. I think stunned is fair. Yeah. yeah. It's like suddenly they're confronted with themselves and they're yeah. like, whoa, wait a second. Whoa, you know, what, what is this? You know, I'm feeling something. So, but it, it is, I, I tell you that the, the, I have time now. I'm home. And so I have three horses in the barn. And after watching Bob Bowker's um, seminar, seminars. Um, one of the horses is laminitic and I've started doing her feet. We talked about that. It's actually Joyce's horse because um, her mom has, was very ill and she finally passed a week ago. And so of course, when you have that kind of drama in your life, it, that takes your focus. And so the horse got a little forgotten and I was busy and no one else was paying attention. And so, um, but I, as a result of Bob's work, I've gone out because I do my own horse and I've been taking back her toe and watching those changes. And now that Anne's passed, her horse Dunny is, is there on the farm. And so I'm starting to mess with him. And it's, it's, it's so nice because I have three very different horses to experiment with and work with the pads, do their feet. You know, I'm, I'm measuring because Bob says you should always have a ruler. So I'm measuring the foot and then I'm measuring the imprint on the pad to see if you can use the imprint on the pad instead of having to measure the foot if the horse can. And so it's really fun because I'm getting this chance to kind of explore all these different ideas. And now I'm going to have to go play with like sticking my hands on sacrums and withers yes. um, and doing body scans and reading, you know, seeing what kind of energy. And um, Dunny's been a little bit wild. So he's, you know, just some basic manners we're working on. <laughs> yeah. And don't forget the heart hold we talked about last time, just the oh, one yeah. hand between the... The, the, the sternum and the withers, yeah. That actually might be a good thing to do with Dunny because he he tends to um, uh, go pushy, then fearful, then, you know, like obnoxious. He He's just not grounded, really well grounded. He's always a kind of a busy character. So I have three very different horses to play with. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. I should have said to... I, I think it's really important that we still, um, when I'm talking about being with these horses, I have boundaries, right? They need boundaries. They don't want to be able to walk all over us. If a horse, you know, I use that go away button that Sharon oh, talks yeah. about. Sometimes I have to do the neck, and the head. but I'm teaching these horses, like I'm in, I'm your good leader, right? So yeah. I'm in my bubble, you're in your bubble. And so it isn't all that kumbaya where you're letting somebody walk over you or um, bite your shoulder. It's all, so it sounds like you've got a mix of stuff that's going to be, I wish I could come down and do I know, it'd be really great because they are very, very different horses. You know, Allie, you go, eh, and he's like, oh, sorry. And Dunny, you go, uh, you know, you have to be very loud and clear. Um, and Joyce's horse is, she's great because I'm way, way back in the beginning when she was a young horse, I taught her that she should not come out of her stall unless asked. And so you don't have to put up the strap. Right, and so she, she today she took a little oh, liberty, and then she realized, no, I'm supposed to stay in my stall. Okay, fine, um, but I've got to, you know, get the other guys up on up to speed. Um, so we're we've run over time a little bit. We do have a question here. Um, is there anything in nature that might produce a similar surface as the pads? You know, that's a really great question, and it's an interesting question. And um, uh, um, I, you know, you would think there would be something. Um, but what I find fascinating is like, I go teach in Holland where all they have is sand. There are no rocks. The footing is soft everywhere. And I put a horse on pads and they respond in the same way as a horse in the United States standing on hard ground. So I, I can't explain. It, it would seem to me that there should be some footing out there that would elicit this similar response. However, 
you know, I mean, I'm, and the other thing is, you know, people spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on good footing and special mixes and formulas and fibers. And I come along with a little foam pad and stick it underneath the foot and get way better response. So I, I, I wish I could explain it. Laura, you got any answers to that one? <laughs> I would say the same thing that I can't think of anything in nature and I'm a nature girl. Um, I almost think of some, no, I mean, the closest I get is like a spongy moss um, but that's no good. And, uh, but I would say that, that, um, you know, one thing I've seen people do because the pads cost money is a whole barn will get the pads. Oh yeah. But like and a community so if set. People, if you get enough people to buy in, cause everyone's tight on money right now. Um, that's another way to do it. And so whole stables will get a set. Yeah. As well, even a lot of people right now with social distancing have, times that they can be in the barn, but that would work just fine because yeah. then there would be a barn set and there's times and you just wash them in soap and water and you disinfect them or you can spray them with a disinfectant. So you don't, they won't absorb anything. You don't have to worry about them, you know, harboring anything harmful if you just, you know, soap and water or some, a disinfectant spray. Yeah, it's totally fine. That's a cool idea. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so um, once again, it's the, the hour thing you talked about is by. you don't need the whole set. Yeah, you don't need the whole set. You could just start with Yeah, we gotta go. Yeah, you know, Parafirm does a lot. Um, but, oh, by the way, everybody, uh, you, you probably have already done it, but just in case you haven't, today is the last, this evening is the last opportunity to go to the Facebook page, Surefoot Equine, and nominate your favorite rescue, retirement, or therapeutic riding center to be one of three uh, organizations to receive a free half physio pad. So for Giving Tuesday, I'm donating three half physio pads to three different organizations. Please go and nominate your favorite nonprofit. Um, you know, if, if I had my druthers, I'd give something to everybody, but I, unfortunately that's not quite possible. Who knows, maybe someday we'll get a great donor and they'll, they'll be wanting to do that. But right now we're just picking three nonprofits and um, if you nominate your favorite one, who knows, they might win. Tomorrow, we're going to uh, announce the winners on my webinar at one o'clock. I'm just talking about what it is to be a Surefoot Equine Practitioner. Um, anybody can join that webinar because, you know, we'll talk about all kinds of things. and It'll be really fun. Um, and all these videos can be found on my YouTube channel, Surefoot Equine. And we've uh, finally started up the new website, surefootequine.com. It's still in a little bit of process. We haven't finished it yet, but it's it's up and ready for people to go out there. So um, Laura, once again, uh, thank you so much for joining me. It's always a pleasure to have you and it's so much fun to see this. And I'm uh, really looking forward to, to showing some of those videos to Sharon on Monday on our webinar on Monday at one o'clock. Um, I'll watch it then because I really want to hear what she sees in it. Yeah, and I, you know, I've been trying to figure out how to do sort of a, a webinar with more panelists. The only problem is we all have so much to say. I'm not sure we could get it done in an, in an hour. I think we'd need, you know, half a day. And um, I would all want to say something at once. I could listen to you and Sharon all day. I'm very happy to just be in the, pa in the chat room. Okay, great. Um, so well, I'll talk to her about that. And we'll get that done. So thank you everyone for joining us. It's, um, it's really great to have you along on these, on these fun little uh, conversations. And um, until we meet again, please stay safe and be well. Bye-bye.